and gentlemen, here it is. The most listened to radio show on the planet. Even the other stations are tuned in too. Hi, this is Adam Sandy with Zamperla, and you're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. Hi, this is Jake Coco with Rocky Mountain Construction, and you're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. Hey, this is Aaron from Pursuit of Thrills, and you're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. This is Marcus Lashock, the Roller Coaster Bureau Chief at WGN TV Studios in Chicago. You are listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? Yes, I accept the Coaster Challenge. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? Coaster Challenge Podcast is here. It's time to face your fears. Get that theme park therapy and let us go through Coaster ears. Challenge Podcast is here. Your fear can disappear. We know that theme park therapy can dry up all your tears. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? Yes, I accept the Coaster Challenge. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? We accept because you know we're not average. You're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. A journey where people become fearful to fearless, all from riding roller coasters. So please, secure your hats and glasses, and keep your hands and arms inside the podcast. It's time to accept the Coaster Challenge with your hosts, Andrew Locke. Hi everyone, this is Andrew, one of the executive producers of the Coaster Challenge podcast. I'm here with a special guest today. I am here with Chris from Airtime Thrills. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Andrew. Nice to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So, Chris, to start off with, why don't you tell myself and our audience about yourself, uh, as well as your love of parks and coasters? Yeah. So, uh, my name's Chris. I run the Airtime Thrills YouTube channel. Um, I've been an enthusiast ever since I was about 12 or 13 years old. Um, I was a pretty big-time enthusiast before, like, around the time I started high school. Um, and then I started working at a park, kind of fell out of the coaster enthusiasm for about a decade. And then once my daughter got old enough to start riding coasters again, I kind of started getting back into it. So, um, yeah, so I, I decided, I mean, we started starting Instagram and then all of a sudden that turned into a YouTube channel. And five years later, it's turned into what it is today, which is like, uh, another full-time job. So that's, that's, Pretty much my uh, my journey here, and I, I grew up in Southern California uh, for you know I lived there for thirty three years, and then the last couple of years I've been here in uh, Tulsa, the Tulsa area, Oklahoma, which is a, a big change, but there's a there's advantages of living in the center of the country for sure. Oh, nice Tulsa, right? I, you know, I think you and I might have talked about this at one point, but uh, I recently started a new job, and I work remote. I live in Orlando, and I work out of my home, which is mm-hmm. great. Uh, but my company, and I do certainly they the headquarters there um periodically uh, my company's based in tulsa so oh, you know, yeah. i kind of know that tulsa is not exactly coaster enthusiast central like here in orlando mm-hmm. uh there's not much of any parks wise but it's it's a nice area there's uh, i mean one of the things i've noticed about tulsa uh it's almost like uh like chicago in a way or something in terms of it seems to be like chain restaurant chain capital Oh it's yeah, like, you name it. There's a restaurant chain there, like if, if, you know the chain. You know, I should, well, let me rephrase. You name it. You know, whatever restaurant chain you can play a game. Uh, if someone to name a restaurant chain, it's going to be there. I, I was blown yeah. away by the the so- selection. You know, considering the size of Tulsa and everything, I guess it's the test market or something. But yeah, I mean, I I'm, I live about 20 minutes south of the main city, and we have two two areas where you pretty much can find anything you want. Uh, any yeah, store, yeah. any restaurant, each. So people think of Oklahoma is like the plains, and you know, it's like it's like this, you know, just dis- like desolate area. It's like no, it's it's pretty developed, especially where I am, at least. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a lot there, which is uh, convenient for sure, for sure. So you mentioned that you got back into coasters again when your daughter was old enough to ride. So how old is she now? She just turned ten. So oh, yeah. yeah, she started riding when she was maybe like two and a half. So that was around 2015 or so. That's when we started and started paying attention a little bit more. There's a lot of things that happened between 2004 and 2015 that I just had no idea about. Like I I might hear it in passing. Like I remember when Gatekeeper opened, that was kind of like, oh, interesting. Cedar Point's getting a new coaster, but I had no idea. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Yeah. No worries. I mean, you know, not for the same reason, but for me, I kind of fell away from coasters and parks. I used to go on road trips and i was an ace member originally back 
around the same time, time period, actually almost I- identical to that from like 2004 or so until about 2017. I kind of wasn't really doing parks other than going to Disney. I wasn't really doing a lot of parks mm-hmm. just here and there. Uh, if I traveled internationally for work, I'd go to go to parks, but I wasn't doing road trips and I wasn't an ACE member during those years or, or any club member. And then 2017, I, I kind of found my way into it again. So I can definitely understand where you're coming from. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're, you're talking about your daughter, you know, riding at two and a half or starting to ride at two and a half. So actually, that's a good segue into our next question, which is not so much when she was two and a half, but maybe when you were two and a half or five or whatever it was, you know, that you rode your first coaster. Um, how old were you and what was the coaster that you rode? The first yeah. So, so, you know, I, I lived, I grew up in Santa Clarita, which is just, it's the same town that, that Magic Mountain's in. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I just never really had any interest in going. My parents really never, I never really expressed interest in it. So they never took me. Um, I think we went once in 1992, but I was four or five years old. I remember a few things about it, but we didn't go on any of the rides or anything. Um, I don't think I rode any of the coasters or anything. Um, I remember back in 98 when I was around 10, um, we went to uh, Santa Monica Pier and rode the West Coaster. That was awesome. But in general, I was pretty afraid of coasters. Um, I didn't really want to ride anything. Um, like we went to Elish Gardens in 96. Uh, I didn't want to ride anything there. Um, and it, we'd go to Knott's once in a while. And then it was one time we went and my dad was pretty much like, you know, like we spent all this money to get in here. You got to you got to ride something <laughs> So it kind of forced me to go on Montezuma's Revenge. And um, that kind of unlocked some of my uh, fear of coasters, but not really so much. Um, I kept, I think after that, I was more willing to write other things. Like I was afraid to go on Boomerang, but I still did. Um, but I was still pretty afraid. And it wasn't until 2000 when I went to a birthday party at Magic Mountain where I was like, okay, you're going to have to ride things. And um, the first ride we went on was Viper, and I was just terrified, the, the, the whole lift hill going up there. Um, but, you know, that day I rode everything. There were some rides that I was reluctant to, like Goliath, I was especially afraid of. Superman, I was especially afraid of. But then, like, like Colossus was fine. Like, I, if I was like, if I can ride Viper, I can ride Colossus. I can ride Cyclone. I can ride Riddler's Revenge. Um, so that kind of got me going. And then I think... I think it was not long after that I started becoming interested in joining forums and 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 I didn't travel until 2002 but you know I would go up to Marine World in Vallejo uh, that that next year and then you know we'd go to Knott's and ride Ghost Rider it was uh it was kind of a slow rollout but yeah I would say by 2000 that was pretty much over my fear of coasters Okay, so you said West Coaster. You think was your first coaster? I think that was my. I think West Coaster was my first um, real coaster. Yeah. Okay, and then Montezuma Revenge was your first, you know, inverting coaster. Yeah, it was my first like extreme coaster. Yeah. Right, and then Viper is probably your first really, you know, big coaster. (laughs) I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And how old were you when you rode Viper the first time? Uh, I was twelve. Oh, okay. Okay. So still pretty young. All right. So. You talked about Montezuma's Revenge writing that, you know, kind of got, a you know, some fear uh, out of you. But it sounds like, you know, you still had some things going on there. Maybe even after writing Viper a little bit, you mentioned about being intimidated by Goliath, which mm-hmm. at that point was brand new. That was like the yeah. new coaster there at Magic Mountain. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that because I moved to Southern California in 2000 and I'd never been to Magic Mountain before. And I, you know, got a season pass and started going and it was sort of sort of my home park, even though I lived in San Diego. It was my home, like, mm-hmm. big park. And uh, I remember Goliath being excited for that because that had just opened. Uh, and that was actually before I went to Cedar Point ever. So, yeah, I think Goliath was the, the tallest coaster at that time that I had ridden in 2000. Mm-hmm. But anyways, so was it Viper or was there a later coaster that you really – feel like you got rid of your fear on like the the one that really scares you the most even after conquering you know, i would, say, I would say the last coaster that i was afraid of yeah was probably millennium force um okay. the first time i rode that that was terrifying that was 2002 i was okay. 14 um or 13 or 14 yeah um i think i was 13 at the time still or i don't know 14 anyway um millennium force was i remember being terrified the first time i rode that 
And then there's other rides that I was scared of, like um, Supreme Scream at Knott's was something that took me a long time to, I would ride it, but I would still really be nervous on it. I'm yeah. kind of over that at this point. Um, so I would say, I, I would say like, like the SNS drop tower is probably the last ride. I was like officially nervous to ride. Um, okay. Maybe, maybe the sky coaster in Kiss- Kissimmee. Um, I wrote that in, in 2018. That was a little nerve wracking, but I don't, I wouldn't say I was like scared of it. It was just kind of like, Oh, what is, what is this? <laughs> What's this going to feel like? So you talked about when you wrote Viper, you're still scared of Goliath and magic mountain. Mm-hmm. Talked about even after riding Goliath, you were scared of Millennium Force. Yep. And then you're talking about being scared of like you know towers. So I'm putting together a picture here. You know, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to probably figure out here that height is is your main fear, Dominator, right? Your fear driver. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, like I was afraid of Montezuma's Revenge before I wrote it, and that really wasn't a height right. thing. I think it was right. just a roller. I don't even remember. I think. The weird thing about my fear of coasters really wasn't maybe the height. It was um, falling out, which okay. sounds okay. stupid. But like, I remember thinking like on Superman going straight up that tower that I was going <laughs> to slip out the back, um, which is right. really, really stupid. But at the same time, when you ride hang time, it feels like you're going to slip out the back. When right. you're going up that lip till. Um, but like with Goliath, when I first saw that it had lap bars and not like shoulder restraints, I was thinking like, oh, like that's that's kind of creepy. Like, what if you fall out? Like I was... I was just thinking that and didn't want to fall out of the ride, which is kind of Got funny it. now because I'm always Mr. Like, don't get stapled, get the airtime. Um, but back then I was like, staple yourself because don't you don't want to fall out of the ride. <laughs> All right. So in terms of, you know, truly finally conquering your fear on a ride, would you say that Millennium Force was more significant or say Supreme Scream or one of the SNS Towers? Um, I don't really remember getting over the fear of the SNS drop towers. Um Okay, but, but I know that now I'm like I, I can ride them no problem. It's perfectly fine. Um, I remember when I wrote Goliath, it took me maybe six or ten times before I was like not nervous anymore to ride it. Okay, um, but I, that was back when I first started getting ride. I think after the first time on Millennium Force, that was fine. But that right, first time right. was scary. Um, pretty because okay. I'd never heard anything quite like that before. Okay, so when you got off of Millennium Force, because Millennium Force sounds like a significant one. Like mm-hmm. The one that you really kind of woke up and like, okay, I'm not scared of these anymore. So right. when you when you when you got off of Money Force, how were you feeling that first time? Uh, I was perfectly fine after the first time. It was just the the walk up there, sitting down and, and waiting for the lift hill. I think once the ride was going, I was fine. And and un- unlike Goliath, I didn't feel like I was um, going to be scared of it after that first ride. And that was the case. Right. But by then I was talk- like more of an experienced rider at that point. I would I had been riding for a couple of years at that point. So it was just the first right. first ride jitters. So when we, we talk about the fear journey, which is what we're talking about, your fear journey here, it's a common, you know, very common conception that it seems like a lot of people have. They talk about when they stop being scared on that scariest ride, the one that mm-hmm. intimidated the most. And it's all about the anticipation. So it's, you know, the line. The getting seated and having the restraints pulled down. It's like, okay, this you can't back out now. I mean, you could, you could make a make a big production and you know have them let you out. But you know, basically you're committed. You know, once the restraints are down, and of course, once it once it once it launches, you know, once it dispatches, I should say. So, but then once you kind of you know get to the top of the lift hill, or the launch happens, whatever whatever it is, then everything's fine because the anticipation's gone. So, mm-hmm. and you can think about this with with fear in real life you know you're scared of a test i mean i you know i've been you know i've been scared of tests but like once i start taking a test you know once i'm kind of into it and answering a few questions right i'm like oh i'm doing okay i'm not scared anymore i'm 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 keeping myself calm even if i run across a question that's like oh boy i don't know i'm not sure about this one you know it's not the end of the world so it's all that build up before you know it's like oh i'm gonna have to deal with this tomorrow or in five minutes or whatever it may be so what you've shared there makes a lot of sense um, now, when I asked you about how you felt afterwards, and you said you felt fine, great, but talk to me about any positive feelings, any feelings like uh, of of success or or you know feeling good about yourself because of you not giving in to fear. Like, talk to me about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think at that point I was not going to back out by any any circumstance. It was, there was never a, uh, a thought that I was going to chicken out or anything right. at that point. Um, 
so I don't, I don't think there was any sense of accomplishment afterward, but I think uh, when I first started writing rides at Knott's and at Magic Mountain, there was that sense of accomplishment. Like you were able to go there, uh, not maybe not necessarily on an individual, individual ride, but uh, be, being terrified of half the rides at the park. And by the end, you'd ridden everything multiple times and you're still here to tell the story about it. Um, right. Right. Yeah. So even with the, the lingering nervousness about Goliath and that drop and the lap bar and everything, um, yeah, I would say just I was I think Goliath was probably the one where after every ride I felt accomplished. Okay. Which is why so it was, it, was, it, was my, it was my favorite ride for a while. Like I was like a big like the number my number one coaster, and it wasn't necessarily because I loved it; it's just because I felt like good about the fact that I was able to ride it. Okay, so it sounds like we're kind of going a different direction here. So it sounds like almost you're you're saying that Goliath is the one that scared you the most because yeah. okay, and so then you felt accomplished after riding Goliath more so than feeling accomplished after riding Millennium Force, right? Because because at that point okay. I'd been going to Magic Mountain for a couple of years. I'd been in Knott's. I'd been in the Marine World. I'd right, been to Disney. Right. I'd been to a bunch of places. It was just really like Millennium Force was so intimidating because it was this little skinny track with that straight down drop 310 feet tall it's like it right. was just something i'd never i was yeah um but i wouldn't say i was i think at that point in my coaster riding life it wasn't like oh i felt accomplished about riding okay. it. it was just a little bit of jitters just walking up to that enormous ridiculous looking ride okay okay so all right so let's talk about then after riding goliath then so um you felt you said you felt accomplished you know can you think about Anything beyond that in terms of having ridden, conquered Goliath, how it impacted your life, conquering the fear on that ride? Um, I don't really think I had a lot of, um, you know, other personal issues that roller coasters affected uh, in any okay. way. It seems like um, other than the fact that roller coasters became like my number one hobby for a couple of years for a while, right. I kind of got like obsessed with it. Um but I didn't have a story where I was, you know, af afraid of of different things and coasters broke me out of my shell or of like okay. speaking okay. or anything like that. But it was definitely impactful in my life in terms of the fact that I spent all my time on message boards and meeting people <laughs> at Magic Mountain that I met on the message boards and building coasters, roller coaster tycoon when I wasn't at parks. And yeah, just for between like 2000 and 2002, that was pretty much what I did all the time. Okay. So kind of your early, early teens, you yep. kind of became obsessed with coasters and that's why you wound up, up at say about 14 years old, you know, I guess convincing your parents or, you know, however you wound up going to Cedar Point for the first time, right? Yeah. My dad was kind of part knew of that. that I was, you know, back then we didn't have social media. So we, we would go on message boards and park websites. I remember just like visiting all the park websites and seeing all the stock pictures that they would have the rides they didn't really have video or anything. So um, it's also interesting watching like the travel channel or the discovery channel. They had specials on roller coasters back then. And it was just amazing seeing these things in motion for the first time. It's something that kids these days don't really appreciate that. It's like, yeah, you don't, you didn't see these rides in action unless you were, right. you saw them in person or on TV. Um, Good point. Good point. Yeah. This is before YouTube and yep. yeah, you didn't see video on the internet. There really wasn't part. any video. I, yeah. I don't remember ever yeah. watching any videos on the internet. It was so slow. Yeah, it, was, it was just wasn't able to handle it, and the flash wasn't a thing yet, and yeah, all those things. So yeah, for sure. Okay, so so going beyond fear, kind of you know, to going well beyond that, how would you say that coasters and parks have had a significant positive impact on your life? Uh, it's just been, uh, especially when we were living so close to Magic Mountain, um, it's, it was just a really nice thing to like uh, to do with my daughter, um, especially on the days where my wife was working. Um, I'd be like, oh, you're working all day on this Sunday, you know, let's go to Magic Mountain and we're going to go ride <laughs> roller coasters all day. And we'd, and we'd go to the kitty, uh, Bugs Bunny world and should ride everything there. And then I'd keep measuring her and measuring her. And then, oh, you're 36 <laughs> inches. Let's go on, let's go across the park to Scrambler. And then the next thing was 42 inches. Like, oh, that unlocks like six more rides that you can ride. And then it was 48 inches. <laughs> and so we just kept knocking out those nice. little increments of, of how tall she was and, um yeah it was fun and, and it just uh she's almost ridden 200 coasters now and she just turned 10 wow. and 
Yeah. And like when I was 10, I had like one credit, you know? So uh, whenever she, she, I mean, she's not like a gung ho rider. Like she's not going to like bug me to ride the world's tallest and fastest coaster. She's kind of nervous still when it comes to riding things. Right. This past summer when we went to, when on our trip, she was still pretty nervous about riding a lot of stuff, but she really broke out of her shell at Dollywood. Um, after we left mm. Dollywood, she was pretty much fearless at that point. It was kind of like we were having to hold her back from riding things we didn't want her, her to ride anymore. Like if the ride was too intense, if the ride was too rough, we wanted to keep her away from that from now because she's still, her brain's still developing. We don't want her to, to mess her up. So like right. no I-305, um, no Grizzly at King's Dominion. Yeah, we're just right. um, trying to keep her away from that kind of stuff. So whenever, if she ever does act scared of a ride, I kind of try to convince her to do it. But I also remind myself that when I was her age, I wouldn't come close to anything like that. So right, right. in a different spot in that, in that way. Yeah, no, it sounds like you're doing things right with your daughter. And, you know, we hear stories of people that we interview on this podcast where they themselves or they've seen it with others or they even admit it to doing with it with their kids where, you know, they again, they either have been, quote unquote, bullied, so to speak, by their parents or older brothers or sisters or whatnot, or or they've done mm-hmm. it with their kids and they regret it where they're kind of really push. And, you know, I had peer pressure from my friends. Uh, that got me onto my first inverting coaster. It was inversions mm-hmm. that scared me, not height. I'm not really scared yeah. of heights. Um, but my friends were cool about it. You know, they were just like, come on, Andrew, you'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy it. They were coaxing me. It was really, they were not yeah. really peer pressuring me. And they were successful. And, and they, you know, that, that's when I became a coaster enthusiast at 17, riding um, Great American Screen Machine at, at uh, Great Adventure for the first time. Mm-hmm. I grew up in New Jersey, but, but again, you know, the stories of people kind of being kind of like, oh, you're a chicken and, oh, come on. I was riding these things when I was half your age, you know, where, where, yeah. you know, sometimes parents can get, you know, really kind of a little bit too mm-hmm. aggressive, maybe, you know, it sounds like yeah. you're not doing that, which is great. And, you know, yeah. it's interesting. I, yeah. Go ahead. I think, yeah. My, I think my, my background of how I got into coasters and how I felt about coasters until I was 12. Also, you just got to think back and be like, you know. You know, she's way ahead of where I was. So anything that right. she doesn't want to ride, just don't don't make her. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting. I don't have kids, but, you know, I have a you know a lot of friends that do kids, grandkids, even, you know, some of my older friends. Uh, and what I've noticed is it, it's kind of different nowadays than, say, it was say, to 20 years ago. Now, with social media and everything, there's all this connectedness and competitiveness to some degree as well. But with enthusiasts that have kids, or even they even do with their grandkids, um, they get them, they're doing, like you said, they're measuring them. Or, you know, I guess parks, maybe parks aren't listening to this too much here. I know, again, I'm not going to name any names, get one in trouble. But, you know, I, I have some friends where they'll put like the tissue paper, paper towels in the kids' shoes to get them, you know, to above, you know, an inch higher to get them above that threshold. And again, doing something like that, it's not going to be dangerous. It's just a little bit of it's half an inch of paper or whatever. But, I, I, yeah. I do admit that when yeah. I even I even have a vlog on it when we went to go ride Revolution for the first time. She yeah she was at forty eight inches, but um we did put her her tall shoes on that day. <laughs> yeah yeah. So but you know just basically getting you know kids into onto these rides as soon as possible and you know helping them to overcome their fears by I mean by like you know with your daughter if you think about it you were getting her on those rides as she was getting tall enough. So she was gradually moving up. Right. She was exposed to the park quite a bit, you know, going whenever your wife was working mm-hmm. or, or whatnot. So you really were conditioning her in a good way. But, and that's what I'm seeing again with a lot of enthusiast friends. So, and then, you know, you think you wind up with 12 year olds that have 200 coaster credits, for example, and, you know, you're not the first person to, to tell me something like this. And then that creates sort of like almost like a super enthusiast potentially, when yeah. that 12 year old, you know, continues to grow up through their teen years, oftentimes, not always, they'll get into the coasters, they'll do planet coaster, no limits, they'll be get into social media, coaster kids, meetups, coaster clubs, they'll be doing all that stuff, even as a teenager, uh, you know, and then you wind up with a situation, uh, like a recent guest we had on this podcast, and a friend of mine, uh, Bradley Edholm, who is 24 years old, and he has over 1,300 credits. And, you know, he, his parents were both enthusiasts. Yeah. Still are. And they started him young. So it's, you know, like mm-hmm. what you're doing with your daughter. So, yeah. 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 I think it's really cool. Again, I don't have kids. I don't want to have kids. This is my, my personal choice. But I can vicariously live through people like yourselves and friends and so forth that have kids and kind of enjoy that. And I do like being the uncle. 
So that's right. Fun, you know, that's the fun part. Stuff. Yeah. 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 So, all right. Well, well, thanks for going on that journey with me and the fear journey and, and so forth. And, and now we're going to talk, kind of get into the middle of the interview and talk about something a little different related to coasters. I think this mm-hmm. is some fun questions. So how many, how many coasters have you ridden? Um, where am I sitting right now? Five sixty three or something like that. Oh, okay. I think so. Yeah. All right. You and I are very close. I'm at five forty. So yeah, mm-hmm. pretty. So we, I can relate. You know, that's a lot of coasters. So mm-hmm. you, you've had a lot of credits. So a lot of experiences at the parks at this point. You know, you had it quite a bit. You know, as a teenager, preteen into your teen years, got away from it, but now you've gotten back to the parks. Obviously, with all the things you do covering with airtime thrills and all that. Yeah. So lots of rides. So tell me, what of all those rides, what has been your craziest moment on a coaster? Hmm. Craziest moment. Um, have I had any other, I mean, uh, if I had to say a crazy moment, it'd probably be getting waterboarded while riding Fury. Okay. Um, <laughs> I definitely need to explain that. I think I know what you're getting at, but please explain. Yeah, we, we were, I mean, like I always say, even when it doesn't rain at Carowinds, it rains at Carowinds. So <laughs> we were at a par- at the park and it just starts pouring or on the front row of Fury. We're like, you know, we've ridden coasters in the rain before. It's it sucks, but it's it's okay. But you've never ridden a ninety five mile an hour coaster in the rain before, right. and and we're in the front row, and we're just getting destroyed. So we're wearing jackets. So we take our jackets, we put them over our face, and the rain just starts like driving straight through the fabric, straight into our face. It feels like we're getting we're drowning on the coaster. <laughs> so I'm like, we actually. Kind of got waterboarded on Fury three two five. So then we get back to the station. The op says, "You can guys and stay on if you want." And we're like, "No thanks. We're gonna we're gonna leave." <laughs> and we're like, "We just turned down a front row ride on Fury three two five, right? Um, we ride, yeah, but, yeah. The circumstances, yeah. Especially living here in Florida. I mean, I've had rain rides before moving here, but especially living here, you can bet I, I get rain rides. Uh, you know, when we have storms, when there's not lightning and thunder, or it's not close enough yet, so they're still running the rides. But mm-hmm. uh, I remember uh, around this time last year, had some friends visiting from Ohio, and we were at uh, SeaWorld, and we jumped on Mako in the early part of the day, and it was raining, and it was cold. It was, you know, winter time, and woof, yeah, that was uh, kind of like a waterboarding event. Yeah, it's yeah. Again, Mako is, again, it's not Fury. Like Fury's yeah. little brother, but it, it still goes pretty fast. I mean, it's not any five, but it's up there. Mm, yeah. Uh, so you know, yeah, yeah. So I can definitely relate to what you're saying. That's a pretty crazy moment. So now, by the way, where do you live nowadays? Oh, I'm in t- the Tulsa area. That's right. You told me that. Yeah. Sorry, it's been a long day. Yeah, no problem. Years, nice. It's been a long day. So okay, gotcha, gotcha. All right. So are you in Tulsa because of work, by the way, or? Uh, it was a complicated situation during COVID. Um. And it's something that I wanted to move for a while. Um, we chose Tulsa because of family reasons. Um, but yeah, obviously it wasn't a coaster related decision. I was, right. I was kind of pushing for Southern Ohio for that reason. Sure. Sure. Um, okay. And then obviously the, my original choice was Texas. Um, but yeah, we, we settled on Tulsa, which uh, just because of family reasons and the possibility of people following us out here. And so Okay. I lived in Southern California. I lived, I actually lived just like five minutes from Magic Mountain. Okay. So you, yes, yeah, so you mentioned you, you would used to live there, but you had been living there before COVID. And then, yep. and then, okay. I could not, I, we won't have to get into details here, but I can read between the lines about COVID, California, why that would drive you to move somewhere <laughs> else. And you're not the only one. I, I can understand that. Definitely understand yeah. that. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. So 560 some odd coasters, lots of coasters. What has been your favorite? Uh, my favorite is Steel Vengeance, and it's just hard to believe that anything can top that that currently exists in the world right now. I know there's a lot of great coasters like Zadra, like uh, Conda, or like Ride to Happiness. But when yep. you think about like my preferences on coasters, it's just I love a long ride. I love a smooth ride. I love uh, a ride that's not too crazy intense, and I love a ride that just throws you out of your seat constantly. Right. And I love a ride that has a lot of whip. And it's like all those things that is described is like Seal Vengeance does that and it does it great. So it's just like, ah, what, how is it anything going to beat that? Which is kind of disappointing on one end because it's kind of like there's nothing out there that I can I'm really looking forward to that could possibly be a big, like a number one. 
but at the same time, it's like there's this spectacular coaster that's only, you know, you know, a couple hours on a plane for, away from me and I can go right, right whenever I right. want to. So it's not so bad. <laughs> right. I mean, given that the name of your channel is Airtime Thrills, I'm not surprised that Steel Vengeance would be number one or be right. high up there. <laughs> I told, I mean, it is not number one. No, no, no offense. I mean, you know, it's kind of comparing and contrasting. It is nowhere. It's not even my top 10. I am uh, not a big fan of Steel Vengeance because of the airtime. It, it, I like airtime. Don't get mm-hmm. me wrong. But, you know, if someone would call me airtime Andrew, I'd be, you know, I'd be fine with that because I like airtime. Yeah, no problem. But I like other things besides airtime. Mm-hmm. And my issue with Steel Vengeance is it's an imbalanced coaster. It's It doesn't fit the um, Goldilocks formula, so to speak. Uh, for coasters, it, it just has way too much airtime and not enough other things. That's my issue with it. Yeah, um, no, I, but, I get it. But, I mean, that's why yeah. I like raging. <laughs> I, I love raging bull more than yeah. other BNM hypers, and that's not exactly it doesn't have as much airtime as some of the other ones. But I feel right. like it's more balanced ride, so I, I understand yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, and then BNM hypers, and yeah, they're uh, they have a lot of airtime. And again, I don't have any BNM hypers that are in my, <laughs> anywhere near my top ten. You know, it, it's just I like a balance and like other things as well. Let but, me guess, you could, you got yeah. a lot of intimates in your top ten, don't you? That's correct. Yeah, it seems <laughs> like people. A, if some Mavericks, like some Velocic coasters. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I actually there was an intimate poll today. Uh, not a, not a poll. Um, those are fun too. One of those, you know, ask a question like a sticker, and then you can take the sticker and do your version of it. You know, whatever that's called. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the the it was something like um, how many of each manufacturer. Uh, mm-hmm. rides are in your top 10 or uh, yeah. whatever it was phrased differently but so i did it you know i started having fun with that and i put a picture of my number one which is taryn and uh my numbers came out to be again top 10 so 10 total seven intamin one vacoma one mock and one gravity group you can probably figure out what the gravity group one is i'm <laughs> guessing that's voyage i'm guessing the vacoma is probably voice. fly uh, Vacoma's fly. That's correct. Okay. I don't know if and I should say figure... FLY or fly. <laughs> it, what was it, the other it's one? Fly. It's fly. Yeah. And then, okay. uh, can you figure out what the mock is? The mock is pro- is it ride to happiness? I don't know if yep. you've written that yet. It's ride to happiness. Okay. Yeah, I just I just wrote it for the first time on Christmas Day. Actually, it was an oh, epic beautiful. Christmas. Yeah, with, wow. uh, with some friends. Yeah, um, yeah. So, but yeah, ride to happiness. It has some great airtime, but it's a balanced mm-hmm. coaster. It's yeah. not just airtime. So. Um, but uh, it, it, it will, it will, you've not ridden it yet, right? I think you said. I, I haven't been out of North America yet, but I'm, I'm going to, uh, this summer I'm going to Scandinavia. So, um, it's not, it's not the greatest collection up there, but it's something I haven't experienced yet. And I'd love to. So, and, um, coaster cruise going up there. And oh, are you going a- on the coaster cruise trip? Yeah. I will see you on that trip. I'm there. Oh, you're going. I will nice. be there. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's you know, if I had a, a number one pick for like my first international trip, I would probably choose Germany, Poland, Netherlands. Um, that would be like the best collection of coasters, I think. Um, but this one's got quite a fit, uh, some good ones also. Um, and and it's, it's just like, you know, I've never traveled internationally before. I think it'd be good, good to have like a, a guided tour. So I think it's a, a good first trip outside of this uh, this continent. Yeah, I mean, I've done a number of Coaster Crew events. Uh, I'm good friends with Tim Halloran, owner of Coaster Crew, president mm-hmm. of Coaster Crew. He lives here in Orlando as well. Uh, I've, you know, I've done, you know, I think three events with him now. I mean, it depends how you count Hollywood Nights because that's not really a Coaster Crew event, but it's they're one of the clubs there. Um, but I've done, you know, some some of their dedicated events besides that, and I think you'll really enjoy um, the Norden trip. I'm I'm certainly sort of looking forward to it. Uh, because Tim really d- puts his heart and soul into these trips, which is also why sometimes it takes him a long, little longer to get the details out before the event because he's working on the mm-hmm. gritty details. He really likes to try and make it really good for everybody where everyone's enjoying it. Yeah. Um, and and to your point, you know, I've been all over Europe. I've been all over Asia, Middle East. Uh, since you haven't, you're doing, I think you're doing the right thing. Sure, a trip like that is not the cheapest. I mean, if you want to do something on the cheap, you know, you're going to get a bunch of friends, rent a car together, share hotels together and all that. But but in terms of doing something that's comfortable, that's a high quality experience and you don't have to worry about anything, you don't have to worry about renting a car. You've never traveled overseas. You're doing it the best way possible. So, yeah, the and, and, and obviously the, I don't know what the price is going to end up being, but I saw the estimate and it's like it's, it's not that bad. I mean, I just spent $10,000 going yeah. to Florida this summer. So 
Oh my, yeah, Florida's to be so expensive. But yeah, it was it was just because yeah. of the, it was a family trip, so um, right, right. Well, the park a lot, tickets, a lot, of, a lot of tickets, yeah. a lot of uh, food, a lot of um, like the hotels had to be nicer. Than oh I yeah, used to. Yeah. I'm used to staying in the, the worst dive hotels that you've ever seen. <laughs> but the family I had to get the 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 Hilton properties and you know the Marriotts and all that stuff. So oh yeah, yeah. I mean that's the common theme when when people come here, especially with families. You know, it's tickets, they add up because they're very expensive. One of the most expensive theme park tickets in the world are mm-hmm. here in Florida, here in Orlando. Yeah. Uh, and then and then the hotels and the rental car, you know, it's it's a lot. I totally get it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the, the coaster cruise trip, you'll, you'll enjoy it. And yeah, it's not that expensive. One of the reasons why it's not going to be that expensive, by the way, Chris, is, and I've seen this myself quite a bit, and people, people don't believe me when I tell them about this. I'm like, go there, you'll see it is how cheap park tickets are in Europe. Yep. I haven't heard They're, that Comart unless you in for free if you're an ACE member. Yeah, you get in for, for free or very cheaply with, with Coaster Club memberships. And yep. But, you know, even a elite tier park, not tier park, if you will, in Europe, uh, a Fantasia Land, a Europa Park, $50 a day. Yeah. Of, you know, and, and consider that that Frontier City charges 80 to get in. Right, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm convinced that one of the main reasons why the parks in Europe are so much cheaper is because they don't have the insurance requirements and regulations that we have here in the U.S. So it's one of the reasons. That's when it's an interesting theory. Yeah. 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 But yeah, you'll have a great time on that trip. But uh, maybe not on this trip. But I mean, you know, some some of my friends that are going that you'll meet as well on the Coaster Crew trip, they have not been outside the U.S. And what they're doing is they're extending the trip. I think, yeah. Before, beginning and end and doing. You know, Fantasyland or up a park, and the, yeah, the, the people I talked to yeah. that yeah. I happened to mention they're on the trip. I was like, and they're like, oh, but we're gonna come early and go to Germany first, or we're gonna stay late, and we're gonna go to Poland. And I was like, well, you know, for because of work, um, yeah, I think it's a good, yeah. a good, and also leaving the family for for eleven days. So um, the sooner I get back, the better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I I I was, yeah. I mean, what I was just mentioning, a couple of friends that, again, they've not been there before, and they're extending. Uh, and, and they're kind of following my my um, I don't know if my lead is the right way to put it. Following kind of guidelines for me as they've kind of been a part of my journey going to Europe, especially the last year. I went to a lot of these parks in mainland Europe uh, multiple times, and so I mean, you know they've been asking for advice and asking questions. And but in this case, you know they they um, they can take longer for me. I, I was you know going to consider extending my trip this year and you know the dates were just released today of when we have to get there by and when we have to leave by or when we can leave and i'm like yeah i'm not gonna be able to take any more time off of work then so but so i can relate to what you're saying there it's like you know it's yeah. like 10 days it's probably enough but yeah, yeah. and i'm also i also got another two-weeker um about a month prior to that where we're gonna head up into canada for the first time in five years oh nice so we're gonna hit like you know we're gonna hit you know uh, world's fun and, and lost island and cedar point um and all obviously i needed to go down to hershey park to ride wildcats revenge um probably hit Ken- kennywood so it's just kind of like a big loop up into canada and back down nice. so also because of that trip i really can't swing that much more time off of off of work so I'm, yeah it's yeah. really a short trip i mean it's really just a couple of weekends and, and a week between so um the scandinavia trip or the northern right. trip Right. So it's right. actually not that long, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of parks packed in there. And, then, and it's funny because um, a lot of people will spend multiple days at parks. Like they'll do right. like four days at Cedar Point or something. And I'm, like, I'm just like, man, for me, it's like go one day, spring for the fast lane and then move on. Like if you're going to travel, you know, I'm going to hit as much stuff as possible. And this trip, this Norton trip, they are hitting as many parks as you possibly can hit. Like, and that's that's my kind of trip. Like I love this. Like yeah. go through, go to three parks in one day. Go to four parks in one day. I think we're doubling up quite a few days on this trip, which is is great. Um, I'd rather see more stuff for less time than see less and be able to get a better, like a more complete experience. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Tim, he these these trips, coaster crew, he does them. COVID aside, every year or so, he does like a big mm-hmm. trip. Yeah. And the way I've not done one before, but I have, you know, a number of friends that have done them before. The Europe trip he did previously, mainland Europe, like Germany and so forth. But um, he what he does with these trips is exactly what you like. Mm-hmm. He he does the one, you know, one day at a park, no more than that. Sometimes I think even doing a couple parks in a day, like a small park. 
Right. You know, I think Lisa you know, Berg yeah. might be two days yeah. or a day and a half, maybe. I think. Maybe, yeah. yeah. But for the most part, it's just one, only a day, one day max at a park for the most part. So that, you know, it's kind of aligns up with what you like. I, I like doing both. Firstly, sometimes it's just I want to hit a park and just be done for the day, get my credits. But if I'm a big person that's quality over quantity, I will sacrifice getting coaster credits if I can spend more time at a quality park. I'm talking about an elite, a god tier park, you know, best in the world, top 10 park. Um, I'll spend more time there and I'll go back there again, you know, spending a fair amount of money because, you know, traveling to Europe, for example, versus going to new parks because I want to have those quality experiences and some of these, you know, most immersive parks, best coasters, rides, et cetera. But, um, you know, you mentioned beyond the Scandinavian trip, uh, you know, you said that you're going to be going on, you know, another two week trip. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of looking doing the same thing as well. And again, another reason why I'm probably not going to extend the Scandinavian trip. I would love to go with these friends I mentioned earlier for their first time ever to like Europa and Fantasia land. But mm-hmm. I just, I just can't. But speaking of those, um, you know, like you, I'm planning uh, in like in November this year, a few months after the Norden trip to go back to Europe to hit some of those favorites and maybe do some new things, but go back to Fantasia land Europa park. Um, you mentioned earlier about, going to mainland europe my recommendation to you you mentioned netherlands germany and poland um yep. now since you love seal vengeance go ride zadra i have very strong controversial opinions about energy landia mm-hmm. i call it six flags poland not yeah, a fan of that park at all definitely see why you say that <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just it what is. I've seen. yeah i mean there's a few quality coasters there but um but what i will say is uh, netherlands has some great parks germany especially has amazing parks mm-hmm. But you also should include Belgium. Well, be you know, Belgium's a decent no, no, park. No. Um, you know, Belgium was in that mix too. I just forgot what it was. Called. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, course, no. When, I, when I said Netherlands, I was thinking Belgium with that too. Kind of lumping yeah. in it. Well, Benelux. That, that, is that, that four. Yeah. Yeah. Benelux, those three countries, Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. They're so yeah. small and they're all kind of next to each other. But um, of course, the other one's Plops of Land. So yes. you know, make sure to go to Plops right. of Land. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. For obvious reasons. So, okay. Well, anyway, that's fun. I love talking about international travel. I've done so much of it and I love give, giving people advice and, you yeah. know, certainly, you know, you're doing the Costa Rica trip and that's easy because that's, yeah. you know, everything's done for yeah. you. But or originally, time, originally I was going to do a, a, a week in England. Um, when oh, at first yeah, I was yeah. like, I was like, I want to do something overseas. And I was like, Oh, I'm looking at these parks in England. I'm like, okay. So Thorpe's near London. Alton's in the yeah. middle of nowhere. Blackpool's up by the beach. And then, then Chessington's out in the middle of nowhere. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to have to get a car. And I'm just like, gosh, you know, I've never driven on the left uh-huh. side of the road and the left side of the car before, or the right side of the car. Um, and, I was, and I was like, oh, let me ask Jeff Joyner, because um, he did this oh, in yeah. 2018 with uh, with Logan and Taylor and all of them. And he was just like, oh, it was a nightmare, like driving around London in, 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 in the car and being in the roundabouts yeah. with, with the cops chasing you and everything. I was like, you know what? Maybe my first trip should be something guided and not something right. on the right. own. <laughs> Right. And, and again, like I was starting to say, you know, you, everything's taken care of you on that trip. But, mm-hmm. you know, along the lines I was saying earlier, I love helping people and giving people advice and answering questions, you know, things I've experienced that they haven't. And, you know, I, I appreciate the reverse too, mind you. But when it comes time, when you do want to plan that main, mainland Europe, you know, the, the Benelux area, Germany, and then Poland, um, I've done all of that uh, multiple times in some cases. So I'm happy to just reach out to me. I'm happy to uh, give you advice. This goes to our listeners as well. Uh, I have rented cars in Europe, uh, mainland mm-hmm. Europe. It's so easy. It's so easy to drive there. Nice. I've, That's good to and know. I've ne- and I've, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a car guy too. I, cars are one of my hobbies. Mm-hmm. I have never driven faster than I've driven in mainland Europe because, oh, really? you know, on the Autobahn, you legally, in certain sections, mind you, you can drive whatever you want. I've drove mm-hmm. uh, 220 plus kilometers an hour. So it's like 160, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, you know, it's amazing. So, you know, it's, it's crazy I heard that. Happening. Um, yeah. I think it was Jeff that also said that in Europe, they uh, they will give you a ticket, um, even if you don't get pulled over because they can track your speed. Yes, they have speed cameras. It's it's they don't have the privacy concerns or groups, yeah, a- advocating like we have here in the U.S. So they have red light cameras, all that stuff. So you got to be careful over there. Yep. So I was watching the signs, and I mean, it helped. I was driving a um. Uh, Tesla Model Three. Both times mm-hmm. I drove, I drove over there, and it reads the speed, the uh, speed limit signs right. and so forth. So the car itself is telling me, with uh, basically when I had the gray no sign, which means no speed limit. 
yeah. I could tell when that was the case and you know the car would update or I would see the signs myself and I would slow down again and but yeah, yeah you got to be careful but anyway yeah again happy to give advice there when, when it comes time but uh yeah look forward to seeing you and hanging with you on the, the northern trip on a meeting mm-hmm. person yeah yeah, yeah for, sure. for sure so so favorite coast is still vengeance it was a great fun tangent there what about <laughs> what's uh what's and and this one you know, it's hard to answer, at least for me. I, you know, I, there's a number of coasters I could pick that are on the other end of things. But, you know, what, if you want to just name one example, or if you know the one that you hate the most, your least favorite, what would that be? Oh, well, my least favorite was, was Green Lantern. I think it's well documented on my channel, Green Lantern at Magic Mountain. Ah, uh, um, okay. It was, just, it was like, a, it was so bad. It was almost, it felt almost dangerous. And and after my last ride, I actually was thinking like, if I ride this again, I might like have a medical emergency. <laughs> I might <laughs> like I probably shouldn't like ride that again. Um, yeah. But like like as of co- coasters that are currently existing, um, this time warp at Canada's Wonderland is just was just like you don't want to be on a coaster and just pray for it to be over. But that was what I was feeling on time warp because it was just like let me just bury my head. On this little chin rest and try not to kill my ears any more than they're already <laughs> believing so um yeah i don't know why yeah. they have those, those those head rests around those things because the one at uh coney island doesn't have that and it's better um but the, the one at canada's wonderland is just a train wreck and i can't wait to ride it again this summer just because of, i don't know why i just want to <laughs> just want to complain about it so i'm gonna do it <laughs> do it for the i'll do so, it for the vlog <laughs> i'm not uh, I've not been to Canada's Wonderland. Is that one of those Zamperla flying coasters, yep. so to speak? Okay, yeah, yeah, those are not fun. Yeah, I guess they have I, one at Rye. Pre- they have one at Rye also, which I have not ridden, but apparently it's the same thing and it sucks. Yeah, interesting. Okay, all right. Well, let's um, let's talk about something much more positive. Let's switch gears here. So the kind of last part of the interview is, uh, in this case, is going to be a few questions about our time thrills mm-hmm. about your YouTube channel. So uh, why don't we talk about that? Tell us about it. How long has it been around? What would you say you specialize in? Yeah, so I created it really because I I love ranking things, and I've always loved ranking things. Um, usually it was like sports things, but um, I was on Instagram posting pictures, and it was just like it'd be fun to have like a platform where I can just like rank coasters, like based on whatever category, like per park or per manufacturer or per state or whatever. So. I created it in 2018. Um, my first video was in April of 2018. So I'm coming up on five years. Nice. So if you look at my channel, most of my stuff is countdowns. Um, I don't do a lot of reviews on there. I don't really like watching review videos and I don't really like making them either, but I do love doing countdowns. Um, so that's really, so if people say, you know, you do too many countdowns, uh, it's, well, that's why I made the channel. So that's too bad. Um, okay. But I'm also, um, I was a history major in college and um, I went to, you know, I got my two history degrees so I could teach history. And um, nice. I guess my biggest um, advice to anyone graduating from college is don't graduate during a terrible recession. Because there's no jobs out there. <laughs> yeah. So, so when I graduated from college, I didn't. There was just no one that was hiring. So I just took the first job I could in insurance, and I've made that into a career. So, oh, nice. so I'm doing nothing with my degrees, but what I have done is I've been able to make like mini documentaries on things. Like I've gained the skills to write research and write while I was in college. And uh, a couple of years ago, I decided, you know. The channel was starting to dip a little bit, and I was like, "I need something that will be that will get a lot of attention." Um, so I decided sure. to do the the full length documentary on Magic Mountain, and then oh, uh, okay, that one, yeah. When I released the episodes, I was just horrified about how bad it was doing. Um, so, but then when I put it all together and I released it in full last Christmas, um, I think that thing took off like crazy. It's almost had a million views now. So, oh, um, nice, congrats! So, thank you. And I decided, so I, I decided that, you know, maybe every year I can invest the time to doing a full length documentary on a different park. Um, so last year I did Kings Island. That was, cause it was Magic Mountain's 50th anniversary in 2021. Last year was Kings Island's 20th or 50th anniversary. Um, this year I'm doing Astro World. So that probably won't come out until May, but I've been doing research on it ever since, you know, late December. So, um, 
Yeah, the full length documentaries. It, it's it's a months long project. I go through tens of thousands of newspaper articles for those things. Um, oh wow! So yeah, so I spend about an hour a day going through newspaper articles, and then once I get all every every bit of news I could find on the park, then I gotta write the script. And those those are not short, and they're not easy to make. Okay. So okay, okay, yeah. All right. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, and actually, I'm going to. That last part of what you described there, the documentary stuff, we're going to talk about that here in a moment. It's actually related to a question I'm going to ask you next, but so we'll, we'll hold off on that. But uh, let's talk about kind of the first part you talked about with, you know, kind of the traditional countdown videos you do. So uh, forgive me, um, and this is nothing against you. I am, and this may seem like sacrilege, I am not much of a YouTube person. Yeah, I use YouTube. You know, friends send me clips or I see something online or a movie trailer or occasionally a theme park thing, you know, some ride announcement or whatever. I will watch YouTube videos, but I'm not someone that generally goes on there and just clicks on this and then clicks on this or goes and checks out a creator. Oh, what else do they have? I don't right. do that for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more of a podcast consumer, social media, and you know, other things. No, you know, so it's just me. Um, but however, you know, I have watched one of your creations and was blown away by it. And again, we'll talk about that later. It's not one of the countdown videos. Hmm. Now, that being said, I, I like you, I, I love ranking things. It's fun. It's not, it's not like I'm not trying to say, you know, that this is the ultimate ranking. You know, this is my, you know, I will say it's the best for me. It's yep. my best, mm -hmm. um, you know, greatest of all time for me. But it's just fun to kind of share and compare and, and things like that. And, you know, I, you know, for example, I've kind of gotten more into ranking as time has gone by. And I mentioned earlier, kind of my renaissance back into the parks and into coasters was in 2017, six years now. So I've been definitely building things up, building up, you know, top 10, beyond top 10, now 25 plus. Because I'm not, I've not gone back to rides I've ridden before for the most part. But as I've ridden rides over the past number of years, I will rank, rank them if they fall on the top. But it's not just coasters. I rank dark rides. I rank rapids rides. I love water rides. Um, I rank uh, theme parks. I've not gotten, I've not sat down and ranked amusement parks. Mm -hmm. You know, your Kings Islands, your Six Flags. Well, again, Six Flags Poland, Energylandia is not a theme park. It's an amusement park. Um, and I keep those in separate classes. And I definitely much rather go to a theme park than an amusement park. And the best is to go to a Fantasyland, Europa, Islands of Adventure, Universal, where mm -hmm. yes, they're theme parks, right? But they have awesome coasters too, right? So yeah. that that's my bread and butter. That's that quality I was talking about earlier. But yeah, bottom line is I do love ranking. And I love seeing other people's rankings, and, and uh, in fact, I again I've not watched one of yours. I'm not curious to, but uh, I one of my friends that is a YouTuber that I do try to support, and he does amazing videos. Uh, and he lives just a mile away here in, in Orlando is my friend Austin. He's an insider. I'm guessing, you know, mm -hmm. Austin is. Yeah. Great oh, yeah. guy. Uh, and again, when he puts out a video, I'll get the announcement because I'm subscribed and I, I will watch a lot of his videos. Um, not all of them, but uh, and he just put it out his top 25 mm -hmm. countdown, you know, like that. And all right. Yeah, I'm going to watch this. And I one of the reasons why I was watching it is my number one. Just I just got a number one. Uh, Taryn, when I wrote it in October of last year, became my number two right behind Velocity Coaster. Mm -hmm. There were those intimates we talked about, uh, but they were close. Then I went back for the holidays to Europa Park, Fantasia Land, and you know, to Plops for the first time, a couple other parks. But I, I was mainly going there that time because I one, my company was shut down, so I had the time off anyway. But two, um, I wanted to go to these holiday events. Because especially Europa and especially Fantasia Land, it's the only time you really can get night rides. Mm -hmm. It's very different in the U.S. And my night ride, my first night ride of numerous ones on Terran, that clinched it as my number one. Just unbelievable for a number of reasons why it's why it's so amazing at night. So I've talked to Austin in the past about you know when Velocicoaster first opened. He and I wrote it. Uh, you know, together for the first time, we were there with a number of friends, uh, and you know, I was asking him because he had ridden Terran already, Terran versus Velocicoaster or Maverick, you know, and because he likes Intimate a lot, and he it was hard for him, and he, he switched back and forth. So I was like, hmm, I just got Terran as my number one. I, I kind of changed my rankings because of the night ride, 
I'm curious where Taryn is, where's Velocicoaster lately and stuff. So, you know, his top 25, he just published with his current thinking. And Taryn was his number one because they kept not showing up in the countdown, which mm-hmm. is part of the fun of the countdown. It's like, oh, right. no, he hasn't talked about it yet. <laughs> all is right, it not going to show up at all or is it going to be number one? Yeah, yeah. Right. is it not going to show up at all or is it going to be like really high on the list? And I'm like, oh, he has not shown Taryn. He's oh, I know it's high on the list. He's written a lot of coasters now, but mm-hmm. and it was number one. I'm like, yes. All right. Because I respect his opinion a lot. So I'm like, you know, mm-hmm. I, I appreciate that we have the same number one. But anyways, but uh, yeah, so the countdown <laughs> videos are fun. But. Uh, you know, good segue into the next question. You said you've gotten to these more advanced videos, these documentaries. Now, I love documentaries in general. I'm a history buff like you. Mm-hmm. Um, I like learning about things. I watch documentaries about movies. I love movies about parks, about coasters, about history itself, about world wars, you know, whatever it may be. I love that kind of stuff. And uh, a friend of mine, I uh, used to actually be uh, part of this podcast, used to be one of our producers, um, Nick. Nick Guerrero, a big fan of yours. He uh, mentioned he, he reached out to you. And that's how you got and I got in touch to get you scheduled for an interview. But he also told me about the Kings Island uh, um, documentary. And he says multi-part. And it's amazing. I'm like, oh, wow. I got it. Guys, I love Kings Island. Kings Island is one of my favorite amusement parks. Again, it's not a theme park, in my opinion. Um, and it's But it's a great park for what it is. And I, I love going there. One of the reasons I love going there is uh, I love, you know, seeing my friends there. Jeff Joyner being one of them. Jeff and Logan, mm-hmm. they're awesome friends of mine. Great, great people. Wonderful people. Wonderful people. And I cherish my friendship with them and so many other Kings Island regulars. And uh, I was excited to see, because I didn't know about it, uh, during when watching the Kings Island documentary that you made, how much Jeff really helped you out. That's, and it's like, that's Jeff. Yeah. He loves helping oh, yeah. people. One of the things yeah, I his his dad, out. his dad has a extensive photo gallery. And um, I asked for that early on. I don't know if he offered, I think he actually offered it early on. Um, I think I mentioned it to him and he, he's like, Oh, my dad is a, you can use these pictures. And it's just a gold mine of stuff oh, yeah. from the, from the seventies through the eighties. It's just, it's amazing. Oh, it was yeah. just, it's so invaluable to have that for that document. It was so hard to find footage and, and fi- uh, pictures. I found that with the Magic Mountain. Like no one really took pictures and video of Magic Mountain back in the seventies. But yeah, in, the, in Kings Island, in the, it was um, it helped a lot. It was very very thankful for that. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I saw how much. Yep, you of course did the right thing. You were giving people photo credit, mm-hmm. and it was all joiner, 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 joiner. It's like, oh, this yeah. is awesome. This is so cool. So you know, you talked about how you'd create the Magic Mountain one. And which I didn't know about because again, I'm just not, I don't peruse a lot of YouTube stuff. But right. uh, the Kings Island one I found out about, you know, and I've watched it. I remember watching it uh, over a series of days. I work from home, as I said earlier, eating lunch and eating dinner at home. That's pretty much the only time I watch TV. I don't watch a lot of TV. So I, you know, put on my YouTube on my Apple TV and just get through it over a week or two. And just I couldn't wait to watch more of it. I'm like, oh, this is so good. And, you know, I, I just loved it. But, but what made you decide you did the Magic Mountain one? What made you decide to do the Kings Island one next? So the Magic Mountain one was because it's my, my home park and I kind of I grew up with it. And sure. um, just the whole history of the park's always been in- interesting to me. And uh, even though I knew a lot about it, I also learned a ton about everything. And just when you grow up with a park and you've been going there for half its history, like that just was an obvious, like clear pick that I, I needed to do it. But for Kings Island... Uh, it was two reasons. One, it was because they were celebrating their 50th anniversary also. It's kind of a natural sure. point to look back at their history. Um, that's why for this year, it was kind of like Worlds of Fun or, or Carowinds. I was like, mm, maybe I'll go off the board this year and go to do Astro World because the, um, Carowinds would have been a decent one. But I kind of wanted a, a park that was, was popular and people really um, had interest in. And also because Kings Island is my number one park that I've ever been to. Um, I think just because it, it combines the great ride collection with the quality. And then the thing that puts it over the top for me is the way the parks run and the operations. Yes. It's it's so yes. noticeable. Like I've never had a day there where it was like, Oh, this parks, I mean, Cedar point's great too, but I've had a few days over the last few years of Cedar point where they were just not, they were not having it. It was just a yeah. disaster. But Kings Island, it's just, they're always firing on all cylinders. They got all their, you know, all the rides are running at full capacity. Rides are rarely closed. And if they are closed, there's a good reason for it. Like, I think the only ride yeah. that was closed in my, my last few trips was Racer, and that was because they were retracking it. So it's understandable. 
So, right, um, right. so after my 2020 trip, I was like, you know what, this is my favorite park. And I made a video explaining why. And then it was just like, you know, Kings Island's 50th anniversary, rich history. Lots of interesting things have come through that park over the last 50 years with the beast and the son of beast and the bat. And uh, yeah, it was just, it just seemed like a natural thing. It was kind of like, if I'm going to do a documentary, if I'm going to invest the time to do a documentary, if I'm going to invest four months of my time to do a documentary, it's going to be for a park like Kings Island. Nice. Yeah, no, that you a lot of good answers there, good reasons. And I, I you know, totally relate. Uh, you know, I've been to Cedar Point numerous times, been to Kings Island numerous times. And I used to think this is kind of going back to the my first uh, tour, if you will, as an enthusiast from my, you know, 17 when I when I really conquered my fears until my college years, you know, going in, back into the early 2000s, uh, you know, before kind of getting away from it. And then, my, you know, during that first tour, towards the end of that, I'd gone to Cedar Point a couple of times. And I've been to Kings Island too. And I love both, but Cedar Point was like, oh my gosh, it's the best amusement park. You know, the coaster collection, all like it's it's just incredible, incredible. And I still would say, you know, Cedar Point's amazing. But in my second tour, starting back in 2017, I've been to Kings Island and Cedar Point numerous times. It's been a switch between the two. Mm-hmm. And Kings Island really has has, in my opinion, taken that number one Ohio park spot for me. And it's for the reasons you mentioned, the operations, the ride collection, how it's matured. Uh, now, this is sort of not park specific, but in a way it is. I think the, at least the ones that I've met, for the most part, the locals, the the mm-hmm. enthusiasts that live there and are always at Kings Island, the ones I meet up with, just a great people, great selection of people, the joiners being an example of that. I've gotten to know, you talked about the operations, operations at Kings Island are incredible they are almost as good as universal orlando yeah that's how good no, they are totally agree yeah and and, and it's and weird that, they, they can get everyone on the same seems like everyone's on the same page i was like yes from the lowest level employee to the full-time managers they all have the, a good attitude and it's yes. like how do you even how do you even get that i'd love to yeah. sit in on like their orientation or something just to see how they can just kind of drive that or maybe it's you know i don't know because i worked at magic mountain and we didn't have that it's yeah it's like everyone yeah. was off in their own thing the morale was pretty low it just seems like it, king's island's completely different oh yeah no for sure and and i again i'm a little bit biased i mean well you know i, I know i have a number of friends that work in the industry you know, mm-hmm. at the parks and even you know i have friends that work for universal creative and all over the place but at, in ops i have a number of friends that work in ops and you know universal orlando disney king's island carowinds all over the place and the friends I have at Kings Island, they are just so passionate about what they do. I'm not saying the others aren't other parts, but every friend that I have that works at Kings Island, they are so passionate and so devoted to their jobs. And it shows and it makes a, a huge difference. I'm not going to I don't want to I don't like to get into negativity on this podcast, but I could easily contrast me to it after we're done recording another park, one of my home parks. That's all I'm going to say. That is at the other end of the spectrum with consistency and quality and operations. Mm-hmm. And it's a huge difference for me, huge difference. And it really stands out. So I completely understand why you would choose Kings Island. And I loved how you filmed it, you know, or I say filmed it, how you produced it, how you edited it. It's so simple, but makes so much sense to do the five parts, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, yep. you know, for the 50 years. So right. five parts made a lot of sense. But for me, I've watched bad documentaries, you know, and where they're just, they don't keep you involved. They don't keep your attention going. They don't have you wondering where's this going to turn next? What details did I not know about this place? I've spent so much time in and am I going to learn next? Mm-hmm. And that's how it was with Kings Island with your, with your documentary. It was, it just kept me going. And, you know, I, there are a number of people like yourself that you know youtube channels and whatnot that do documentaries that's one of the things they do and in my opinion now granted i've only seen one of your documentaries um i I need to watch magic mountain because that i love that park it's one of my home original home parks from you know when i lived in california as i said earlier but in my opinion it's you and kevin perjurer Oh yeah, Kemplan, well, yeah. I don't want to compare myself to Kevin Perger. <laughs> I get uh, it. I, he's on I, a professional level that I can never match, but he's um, my God, yeah, yeah. I, I do. No, I, I know. 
No, absolutely. No, I mean, I, again, I'm not going to name names about, I'm, about others that I'm not putting up there, but uh, I have seen other people's documentaries and they're quite good. Even ones that were sold uh, to pay f- to view, uh, to say that much. But in my opinion, your documentary Kings Island is even more up there in terms of what I liked. Just like, in my opinion, you what you do is similar to the style of what Kevin does. I realize you may not put yourself up there with him. Yeah, I, I get you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah. I, I've always kind of had a. I, I've never gotten into it professionally or anything, but I, I just have always liked the idea of producing something like that. Like, um, yeah, like like a, like a with the mixing the music and with the dramatic yeah. cuts and everything. Like I've always exactly. really been fascinated with it and it's, you know, being an amateur, it's, you know, I do my best, but I, I appreciate that, that you oh, yeah. enjoyed, enjoyed that piece of it. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, keep, keep it up. In my opinion, it's a great style. And, you know, it's one more comment on the funk lens, which you're talking about them right. uh, just because of the timing. Uh, last night I was hanging out with some friends here in Orlando I was at their house and we were having dinner, watching some YouTube they had, you know, and they, they're real big Disney people. They love mm-hmm. Disney. And so my friend asked me, Hey, have you seen the Epcot, um, uh, uh, defunct land video? I'm like about the, you know, leading up to the creation of Epcot and you know, what Walt was trying to do there and everything. No, no, but I love that story. I mean, I've seen things about mm-hmm. the story. So we watched that during dinner and then, you know, something that was incremental or imp- a very uh, instrumental, I should say in Walt's in terms of what he did with the parks and what he was trying to do with, with Epcot, the, his original idea for Epcot, he was very much influenced by the world's fairs. Mm-hmm. And my friend and I, uh, that, you know, we were talking there and he and I both love the concept of world's fairs, but we're both too young. We never have gotten to really go to one. And right. he's like, he's like, have you seen Kevin's world's fair documentary about the New York's world's fair in 1964? Mm-hmm. I'm like, no. So we watched that next. And just so such good. It's just yeah. so riveting. I so yeah. Keep up the documentary work. I the, love it. The one, the one that yeah. I, the, yeah. the Funkland episode that I yeah. probably my favorite. It's probably Hong Kong Disneyland. I've watched oh, that one a couple okay. times just to get some background information because I was doing some work on it. And it's just like I don't know of all the ones he's made. That one is the is the bee's knees. <laughs> so that nice. One, that one's nice. great. And then he, he did it on Green Lantern also, and he actually reached out to me to get some of my footage for oh, it. Nice. So I was happy to help him with that because um, that and that's one of his was watch videos which is funny <laughs> it's like you must watch videos on this horrible coaster that sometimes how it goes <laughs> and actually i just realized another reason why i probably compare you to him your voice is similar to his mm-hmm. i don't know if you have noticed that but it's it's similar that, that's, yeah that's so, true i i have really yeah. i mean my voiceovers are just a struggle <laughs> it's just they're so hard for me i don't know I can talk. I can talk better in a one-on-one conversation. But when I'm trying to talk on the microphone, it, it doesn't always go great. It, sometimes it gets rushed. Um, yeah. So whenever people say that, I'm just like, I know, I know, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. And then like, it's it's just like you know when people say, oh, it's a tongue twister. For me, it's like everything's a tongue twister. Like you have to you have to find the ones that aren't tongue twisters. And when I'm writing a script, I I'm writing I'm reading it back. I'm like, I'm not gonna be able to say that. I have to right, delete it and right. reword it. So yeah, it, it's it's tough, and I, I just appreciate people like Kevin. Um, the way he narrates his his uh, his videos is just so professional and, and and just smooth. So oh yeah, yeah. Another one. If you're ever looking to get like different types of advice, obviously you could talk to Kevin. But you know, besides Kevin, one person I'd recommend you talk to if you're kind of trying to get your alliteration better, learn some tricks. Um, just blown away by how good he is with his alliteration is Sean from Theme Park Worldwide. Mm-hmm. He, he is so good with his, his 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 narration and his his vlogs and everything. He's just he rarely makes a mistake, and he's he's not too fast, and he's just so yeah. good. So that's another yeah. one. But yeah, so so you did the Magic Mountain documentary, did yeah. the Kings Island one, mm-hmm. do Astroworld, and I never got to go to Astroworld. You mean neither? I, oh, so. you neither. Okay, no. so you 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 did you're doing the documentary from the perspective of having never gone. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Looking forward to that one. What do you think you'll do after Astroworld? Yeah, from there, it kind of lines up very nicely. Um, Great Adventure is kind of the natural one for seventy uh, for 2024, because that's a 50th anniversary for that park. Right. Um, after that, then you have a couple options. I think King's Dominion would be a great one to do for for 2025. That's their 50th anniversary. Right. You could also, you could also do Disneyland for their 70th. But... Um, 
I don't know. It's weird. I always thought that Disney content would do great because everyone loves Disney. Um, but my Disney content, man, that did not do well. My Six Flags content is way better than my Disney content. Um, it's, yeah, it's I, I just, probably I think Disney people. I think Disney people have their own people. <laughs> so I don't yeah. know. That, that's that's kind of what I was thinking. What my guess is, and again, I'm no YouTube expert, kind of like what you just said there is, and there's nothing against you. There is so much competition on the Disney side of things. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. There's so, I mean, for every, I, I'm just going to make a guess. For every poster focused channel, there's probably 10 Disney channels you yeah. know, in terms of and, and And the Disney channels are hardcore Disney. Yeah. They love yeah. Disney. I don't love Disney. Like, I, I like Disney. Uh, I have nothing against Disney. I don't not like Disney. It's just that I'm not obsessed with Disney. And the people who do Disney content are just like all up in the, the hardcore Disney. I can't compete with yeah. that. So maybe I yeah, should I mean, stay away. Yeah. I mean, I have a Disney World Pass because I live here in Florida. I'm fortunate that, you know, I can have the cheaper passes because they're so much cheaper. And I mean, nowadays you can't even buy passes for the most part. So luckily I got grandfathered in and I, I have more than a pixie pass and all that. And I go once or twice a month. But I, I am not hardcore Disney. I can't be for, well, it gets into politics and stuff. But, you know, I just can't. I can't do that myself. But mm-hmm. um, it's just too much. It's too intense yeah. and there's too much toxicity. But, you know, on a casual, you know, theme park lover, yeah, I do like Disney. Um, yeah, but I think there are better parks on the theme park side than a lot of the Disney parks. But uh, so anyways, that's yeah. one of the reasons why I'm thinking Kings Dominion would be a great park to do. Yeah, the whole the yeah. whole the whole um, Kings Entertainment chain, just the whole the whole story is so interesting with the Paramount takeover and then the Cedar Fair buyout and everything. Oh yeah, it's just so interesting. And then and then um, the next year is, is a lot, quite a few parks. I'm I'm thinking Six Flags Great America would be a great one to do for for the next year. So um, that's kind of how I'm seeing it line up. Um, okay. assuming I'm still making documentaries in, in three right. years, uh, who knows? Right. I mean, I just kind of started doing it. So I, you know, I, I, it's just hard for me to, to imagine myself stopping doing this because it's become like a second job with, uh, like another full-time income coming in. So it's kind of like, if I stop, then, you know, the money stops coming in and then that'll be bad. <laughs> so right. I just don't right. see how it's going to end, but it's got to end at some point. I just don't know how. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And you brought up a good point there. And it's something that, you know, for those that are listening that have not watched your documentary about Kings Island yet, I encourage you to, first of all, uh, it's a five-parter, so you can digest it one part at a time. It's fairly easy to digest. Um, one of the things that I think you did really well is talking about the change in ownership and Taft and Paramount and just the, it's, you know, and, and Cedar Fair. And it's fascinating. And I went to Kings Island originally as a Paramount Park. And then came back to it later. Yep. Uh, so did you know, I. Yeah. Peter Fair. Yeah. A lot of us. A lot of us did. And if you think about it, Kings Island is an incredible park. Uh, it yep. is definitely. I've not ranked them yet, but it would definitely be in my top ten amusement parks. Yeah. Um, and if you if you think about it, a lot of parks they don't change hands for the most part. Um, yeah. I mean, Six Flags has had different owners, but it's still Six Flags. Mm-hmm. Whereas Kings Island, it went through some major theming changes and oh, fundamentals. Yeah changed a lot with some of the ownership changes and it is a fascinating story and you covered it really well so thank you yeah absolutely absolutely so one question that we're starting to ask a new question here in the third season and i don't know if i've given it to you in advance so i apologize for blind sending here uh but we're starting to ask this of our guests is you know let me let me kind of help you here because this is a new question so you know obviously you're enthusiasts you're a dad you know you're loving getting your daughter involved but now you're also really getting you're getting out there the past five years with your channel, the documentaries and so forth, the countdowns. So thinking about all the ways in which you kind of operate in the theme park sphere and the amusement park sphere, how would you say would like your family, your friends, your colleagues to remember you by? Uh, for one thing that I've um, tried to do since, I don't know, especially over the last few years since my channel gain popularity is to be someone who's helpful and is there for people when they need it. Um, I kind of, a few years ago, I kind of had an issue with people taking other channels down for really stupid reasons. Um, You know, okay, yeah, you used 
use a little clip of their POV on their video and then you strike them and get their channel canceled. It's like, that's really screwed up. Um, so like I started my second YouTube channel, which is where I just post off-ride footage, copyright free for anyone to download and use in their videos. And I have over 300 coasters posted on that channel at this point. I've been doing that since 2019. Um, so I just kind of wanted to, you know, I, I, I wish I could support channels more than I can. Um, when I was living in California, it was a little easier. I had a little bit more time to watch other people's videos and comment and like, and everything. Um, now that's very few and far between where I can find some time to actually, you know, watch other people's videos, but at the very least, um, I still provide, you know, I try to get people's footage out there. If they, if they need something, I, I can provide it for them if, if possible, if they need me to come on for a podcast or you don't need to make a cameo in their video, I can do that. No problem. So, um, yeah, I just don't want to be remembered as, you know, that jerk <laughs> with someone who's, um, who can, you know, be out there and, and be helpful and be a positive force, not be the person who struck out six channels and took them off YouTube. <laughs> No, that's fantastic. I love it. Um, I Like I said earlier, I love helping people myself. Um, that's part of why I volunteer my time with this podcast. We don't make a penny with this podcast. If we ever do make money of selling shirts and merch, you know, which we do on occasion, um, that money goes to charity. Mm -hmm. I don't take a penny. In fact, I this is a um, how can I put this? This is a loss for me for this podcast yes. financially because I put money into it, you know, for certain yeah. things at certain times. But again, I love donating my time and even money to help people. And I do that, you know, with friends, I love helping friends out. I was talking about earlier, helping people plan trips. And I love people taking people around parks they haven't been to and, you know, and, and make sure they have a good day and, 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 and all that and fun times. So I can totally relate. I love it. I've not heard of a YouTuber doing this again. I'm not big in the YouTube thing. Maybe others have, maybe not, but you having a separate channel copyright free where people can just download it and use it. That's amazing. That is awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. And, and I've seen, you know, a, a lot of other channels, I've done that, not necessarily on a separate channel, but um, but it doesn't really matter where you put it as long as it's out there. Like uh, Canopy Coaster is someone who just put a ton of copyright free stuff out there. Coaster right. Hipster, El Toro Ryan does it also. And there's other people right. I talk to that don't want to do it. You know, they say that, you know, I took the time to take the footage. I don't feel comfortable with people just using it. That's fine. That's their choice. Um, yeah. and, and then you have the people who will actually go to the, the official channels to take your channel down if they find a clip that yeah. you use it's just that's i think that's ridiculous yeah um, it's petty petty so 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 it seems like more and more i've seen you know you search for footage you'll see people actually put no copyright in the title and i think that's not something i created but at least i, I hope maybe it's something i inspired for some people to do just by having yeah. that channel out there and, and being more of a community where people actually you know really share things um and you know support each other rather than nice. a, a, a breakneck competition i i know one prominent a coaster enthusiast who I secondhand, I heard this, but you know, he says that he doesn't watch other people's channel because they're the competition. And it's like, is that really how you want to see it? Because that's a little messed up and a little too competitive for something like this, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you mentioned, uh, I mean, I recognize some of the names you mentioned there, but in particular, I'll tell Ryan, um, friends with Ryan. He's a great guy. One of the nicest mm -hmm. guys I've met in the, in the enthusiast sphere, as I call it. Uh, and I'm also friends with a, a, a other people that are uh, help with this channel that are on this channel, uh, Mark Martinez, uh, yeah. and then uh, Airtime Mike, they're both great guys. I've yeah. known, I've known Mark for years now. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're good people there. And, uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm not, I didn't know that Ryan offers that copyright free footage, but does not surprise me in the slightest because yeah. he's just such a nice and you, guy. And you mentioned earlier, Austin uh, from Amusement Insider, yeah. he's also yeah. been very generous with his footage and he's got some great equipment. He, he takes on the rides with him and um, it just makes for some amazing content and he makes no limits or I think it's no limits creations that are spectacular also. And yeah, he's just um, another, another great force in the community. So. Uh, oh yeah. Appreciated. I mean, yeah. I mean, I've been friends with Mark or sorry, excuse me, but friends with Austin. Now I've known him uh, since early, well, actually since late 2018 when he was just getting started back then. I mean, yep. he was not the tour de force he is now. He was, you know, getting ready to build things up when he moved here to Florida back then. And I just, mm -hmm. I, I love helping promote him, sharing his videos. And like you said, he's just a great guy, very kind and generous as well. Another good example of that. And yeah, he uses No Limits 2 as well as Planet Coaster mm -hmm. for what I think is his bread and butter, 
which yeah. is his concept. You know, he's he puts his heart and soul, and I don't know how he does what he does. Where the coaster, you don't have plans for it. You don't have a any kind of a concept POV at all for it yet. Park hasn't released it. All they're doing is they've got footers in the ground and maybe some track line there. And yeah. how he, it, it's like one of those things like people that can visualize things in their head just by looking at the ceiling and not having anything in front of them and just, he does it. I don't know how he does it. I forgot what coaster uh, it was that he he made a rendering of. And then I went back and watched it like a few years later. And I'm like, oh my God, you you almost nailed it. Like you got the finale a little bit wrong. I think it was a, was right. a Ryan. It might've been a Ryan where he just absolutely drilled the layout. <laughs> it was just like, yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's a savant with this stuff. And I was just telling a friend about this uh, the other day I was hanging out with, we had Austin on here uh, when Velocicoaster Coaster first opened. Mm-hmm. He and I had already ridden it a number of times and we kind of unpacked Velocicoaster. Coaster. We did kind of a brief interview like you and I did the first half, you know, the typical interview. We spent a decent amount of time talking about Velocicoaster, Coaster and I had a special surprise for him. At that point in time, this was, you know, May of 2021, there was only basically one illegal POV on YouTube. Uh, from Velocicoaster, because it's so mm-hmm. hard to get equipment on that ride, of course, yep. the metal detectors. Someone had right. it, and it was, wasn't me or Austin, someone else. And so I took that video. It was already out there, so I, I took it, and I did a side-by-side video with Austin's concept. POV, the latest version of it, mind you. Yep. Um, and, you know, it's not like he updated it really after he wrote it. You mm-hmm. know, he, the last time he'd updated that video was months before. And I synced him up before I, I did the interview with him. And during the interview, like you and I here, this is a podcast. It's audio only, but we were on Zoom together so I could show him something. So during the interview, I think we wound up cutting it because it's kind of awkward. to t- You can't talk about video without showing the video for a few minutes. But but anyway, I, while I recorded the interview with him, at least, I showed him the side-by-side and how close he got it. Mm-hmm. And. You know, to and I was that was one of the ways I want to show appreciation for him. Like awesome, the work that you do is just incredible. So and that's yeah. this is better bread and butter. But anyway, there's a lot of good YouTubers out there. Uh and you know, Coaster Challenge started as YouTube. Uh, you know, I would get some video for the channel. This is in the early days, but then we pivoted to podcasting. But I, I decided to start helping David when I met him in 2018 because this isn't a channel that's about making money. No respect to people who do. And I felt like I can be part of this and not have to be a competition, feel like I'm in competition or whatnot. Not, not because, like you said, there are these YouTubers that, you know, are in it, you know, even to make a living off of it. And some of them are great. Austin makes a living off his YouTube yep. channel along with buying the thrills. But mm-hmm. he's a nice guy. He remains mm-hmm. nice. But unfortunately, as you pointed out, there are others that haven't. And it's just it's really unfortunate that this this hobby is all about fun. And theme park therapy, for that matter, these positive things people get can get negative when they start competing with each other. It's and I'm glad glad to hear that you're not one of those. <laughs> right. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was interesting to talk about that though. So uh, you know, great. I, I think it's great that you want to be remembered by someone that helps people, and you really demonstrated how you are that way. And I'm sure you will be will be remembered that way. Uh, now, speaking of being helpful. Another good segue here. I'm killing the segues, I think, today. Um, one of the last really main questions we ask is, what advice would you like to give those that are listening? Uh, so you're talking about advice for writing coasters or, or YouTube type of advice? Um, this, I, I would say, I mean, it could be that, but normally this advice is in the in the spirit of the mission of the podcast, Theme Park Therapy, Facing Fears, uh, living a positive life overall. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you take a look at my history through coasters and it seems like it's, just, it's weird that it seems like a lot of people who are into coasters used to be afraid of them. And I don't know if that's just because everyone was afraid of coasters at one point. Um, it doesn't seem like that's the case, but it seems like people who've overcome that fear have really, really are you know, they, they get into coasters more so than people who maybe weren't afraid of them at first. And it's kind of a strange dynamic where obviously that happened to me. It sounds like it happened to David also. Um, so yeah, I I just think that, you know, as long as you're not going to do something, anything crazy, um, diving into things a lot of times will pay off for you. And if you, 
if you're afraid of something, it's, it's, you're if you're just going to, I think most of the time you're just going to regret not trying something new. And um, I just can't imagine any time in my life where I tried something different and regretted it. So if you're out there and you're afraid to, you know, if you're afraid of the park and you're afraid to ride the ride, you're going to go home and you're just going to, you might be, I don't, I don't know. I can't imagine how that'd be a positive thing. It's like, okay, I avoided that terror. But if you, you know, and maybe you, maybe you ride it and you don't like it, but at least you can say you did it and now you know. So right. I guess my thing would just be, you know, trust the fact that these things are safe um, and just dive right in and, and take your ride and see if it's, if it's your thing. Cause it seems like most of the time it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's great advice. And, um, you know, the first thing you mentioned, it's kind of poignant about how you've kind of noticed that people who wind up having to face some sort of fear as being part of being into the parks and the coasters, for example, they tend to get more into it than someone that maybe never had to face any fears. They never were scared. And there are people out there that are like that. They, uh, they're fortunate, I think, in a way that they don't have that anxiety driving them in life and they're kind of fearless. But, you know, I, but your point about the most of us who, again, we face fear, you know, you mentioned you have, David has, I have, and it means more. And that's, that's part of that accomplishment. Facing fear is not just good to, so you'll get on a ride. It really is you triumphing over one of the most limiting aspects of the human psyche. Yep. And I mean, not to make it all dramatic, but really that's what it is. And the thing that is very poignant about it that I've noticed in talking to people, interviewing people in this podcast, things I've noticed in my life is by facing fears on coasters, on rides, on these controlled, fun things, we're able to face fear and anxiety better in other parts of our lives, you know, more serious parts of our lives, you know, job issues, family issues, tests, taking tests in school, you know, whatever it may be going on a date, you know. I, you know, public speaking like Jeff Joyner, he's a master of that. So it's, it's, you know, you can take this sort of almost inconsequential thing. Oh, it's just, oh, it's just parks I go to. It's just the thing I do for fun. But really, mm-hmm. it can be so impactful in very important parts of your life. Yeah, so, and, and you really, you really hit it on there about how, you know, people that face fears, it means more to them than people that don't. It's so poignant. So thanks for yeah. sharing. Mm-hmm. So last, so yes, absolutely. So the last thing I'd like to, have you tell us and uh, is again, we've kind of already hinted at it, but you know, we already know your, what your channel name is, but you know, formally now go through, you know, you know, where people can find you, you know, you know, the name of your social media accounts, YouTube, et cetera. Just how can people find you? Yeah. So I am at airtime thrills on Instagram, airtime thrills on YouTube. And then obviously I have my second channel where I, you, I just post footage. Um, I don't expect anyone to really watch it, but if you need to grab something from there, feel free to do so. And then um, last year, late last uh, fall, I started a baseball channel because my first love and my uh, always forever love is baseball more than coasters. Nice. So uh, I decided to make a, a YouTube channel for that. It's called Home Run Productions. And um, so I've been at that for a little over a year at this point. So um, if you guys are into baseball, then you might want to check that out. It's kind of a similar style of airtime thrills in terms of I do rankings and uh, retrospectives and this, um, just, you know, dumb stuff, just uh, stuff that I'm passionate about in terms of Major League Baseball. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. Well, thanks for sharing all that. Mm-hmm. And thanks for sharing your time. Time is one of the most absolutely have in life. So thank you for taking the time today to speak with me and and uh and speak to our audience and uh really appreciate it all right sure absolutely thanks guys i appreciate uh, you inviting me on if you enjoyed today's episode be sure to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast if you want to see more of us we upload every friday be sure to like us on facebook instagram twitter and youtube all at coaster challenge links are in the description below thanks for joining us here today